welcome to another episode of Go Wilder, the show that gives you the opportunity to put your wildlife and photography questions to a panel of experts. And I really must stop rocking backwards and forwards. So here we are in the glorious month of May, and what an amazing time for our cut, migrant birds. Cut, and cut now. What is that what? on your head? It's a hat. I'm hiding my lockdown fro, no. Take it off. No. Come on, just take it off, quickly. Okay, put it back on, put it back on. Apologies for that. Anyway, where were we? Migrant birds. We'll see the return of the swallow, cuckoo, and not forgetting the gorgeous warble of the turtle dove. It's such a great time for wildlife. It's just a shame we can't go out and see it. Lockdown is still in place, but there are whispers of things easing up in the coming months. But until then, which we'll is have to do with our daily exercise and hopefully snatch a glimpse of something special along the way. So this week we've got a great panel of experts from all the way down in Cornwall, right the way across to the Kent Downs. So what are we waiting for? Hi, I'm Rosie and I work for Kent Wildlife Trust. I'm really passionate about bees, but I find all insects really fascinating. Hi, I'm Bob Morgan and I'm a Reserves Officer with the Norfolk Wildlife Trust, working at Hickling Board National Nature Reserve. My name is Andrew McCarthy, I am a consultant ecologist. Uh, I'm also a wildlife photographer, um, so in my spare time I, um, I still get involved with wildlife. Hi there, my name is Richard Burkett, I'm a wildlife and nature photographer and naturalist based here in the UK. Um, I spent 22 years in the military as a survival specialist, so I gained quite a lot of uh, usable skills really to adapt to my photography uh, in ways and means of, of stalking and uh, tracking wildlife. So jumping straight into the pool of knowledge this week, let's talk bees and a question from Isaac in Coggleshaw. How many species of bees are there in the UK? Luckily we've got a specialist who knows everything about bees. Over to you Rosie. That's a really interesting question. So I think a lot of people think that there's just one type of bee in the UK, the honeybee. Whereas in actual fact, we have over 270 different types of bee. Um, and that actually is growing year on year as we find new species. So we've got the one honeybee. We've got 24 different types of bumblebee. So those are the big fuzzy ones bumbling about. And then the vast majority are the solitary bees, which are much less obvious as bees, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of them even look like wasps. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you, Rosie. I'm sure we'll be seeing you later. I'll get my coat. Did you know ducks can sleep with one eye open? A bit like my wife. Identifying birds can be a tricky one at the best of times, but when you've got two birds, which are pretty much the same, some of the same family, same locations, same size, well, how do you tell the difference? Well, here's a question from Harry in Braintree. Hello, my name is Harry, and I would like to know what is the difference between a sedge warbler and a reed warbler? Right, that's one for Bob. The sedge warbler and reed warbler are very alike. They're both small brown birds, and they live in wetland habitats. However, if you do get a glimpse, the sedge warbler is more streaked. It's a rusty brown colour with, with dark lines and a creamy white supercilium, effectively an eyebrow. The reed warbler is more plain, the colour of galaxy chocolate, and has a whitish belly. They live in slightly different habitats too. The reed warbler tends to prefer just plain stands of reed. Whereas a sedge warbler, you may find it in a brambly patch or amongst scrub, but still near or about reed beds. But a really good way of telling them apart is by their song. Um, I was told once a sedge warbler sounds like it's arguing and that the reed warbler is having a conversation with you. And that's true. The sedge warbler has lots of chattering and shrills and often mimics other birds too. Whereas the reed warbler is more of a consistent chattering noise with the odd tuneful whistle and also the sedge warbler often has a, uh, a, a song flight off from a, a, a bit of scrub or some bramble. Right, I need to remember that. So line across the same different sound. One of my favourite uh, birds to photograph along a river is the dipper. 
Did you know the dipper is our only aquatic songbird? Now onto the subject of photography. Now I'm sure you've seen those guys skulking around in their camo. Yes, it's the archetypal wildlife photographer with that monster lens. And here's a good question from Pete. Do I need a big lens to shoot wildlife? Right, Richard, over to you, mate. Hi, Peter, that's a great question and one I'm asked quite frequently, you know, do you need such a large lens? Now, you know, lens, large lenses have their place. Um, you know, they are great for getting that much closer to your subject, um, but actually they're not the be all and end all really. You know, it's, it's really all about um, getting, you know, the right field craft techniques, studying your subject, approaching in the, in the correct manner, reading the subject's signs, um, you know, and all about your clothing as well. Um, you know, fairly sort of drab clothing. You don't have to have camo all the time. Hides are a great thing as well. Position your hide where you know the birds are gonna be. And obviously you can get that just that little bit closer. Large lenses are great. They are expensive. They are heavy and they're quite cumbersome as well. So you're sort of crawling around with a large lens is quite difficult. So a Sensi 200, 100 to 400, something along those lines is, is equally, equally as important really to get, that, uh, to get that great sharp shot. Personally, I use a 1-600 lens with a 1.4 extender, and that kind of magnification kind of suits the style of my photography. I've never really used the big primes, but I'm always open for opportunities. So here in the UK, there are some common misconceptions about our bats. Things like, bats are flying rats. Bats drink your blood. Bats will fly into your hair and build a nest. Well, they probably would in mine. <laughs> well, I think the majority of that comes down to urban myth and the movie industry. Thanks a lot, Count Dracula. And now a question from Aidan in Colchester. How many different types of bat do we have in the UK? That's over to you, Andrew. Uh, Aidan, fantastic question. How many bat species do we have in the UK? Um, well, technically we have uh, 18 species, uh, of which 17 are are breeding. So I suppose you could say we've got 17 native species. Um, and rather than list them all, which would be pretty tedious and I could go on at length about that, um, I thought I'd give you a flavour for, for three of them. One of the smallest bats in the UK uh, is the common pipistrelle and it's the one you're likely to see flying around uh, outside your house, uh, in your garden, um, on a, a warm summer's evening. It's a small animal, probably only about an inch long, inch and a half body length, and about 200 mil, eight inches uh, in, in wingspan. So a small bat. The second one to talk about is the long-eared bat, brown long-eared bat, also another relatively uh, common species, um, about a third the size again in terms of weight, and about, about um, uh, a, li a little bit bigger in terms of body size. Tends to roost in big open roof voids rather than tucked away in crevices like the common pipistrelle bat. And it feeds in woodland, in and around woodland, and it's really well adapted to that because it's able to listen for its prey. Um, and it uses a very, very quiet echolocation call. And the third species to talk about is one of our rarest bats, and that's the greater horseshoe bat. And that's a species that it's much bigger. Um, this is a bat that, like its uh, smaller uh, relative, the lesser horseshoe, wraps its body in its wings and hangs upside down from, uh, from rafters or from, from beams when it's roosting. And it's about so big when it's roosting, so about the size of a small pear, they say. And this is a bat with a wingspan of about 15 inches, so 300, 350 mil uh, wingspan, which is, which is pretty big. You certainly know when they go zooming over your head that, um, you know, needs a, a warmer environment and, and caves and mines to hibernate in. So yeah, three species there, uh, three very different types of forest, foraging strategy and three very different sizes. Did you know that not all of our bees actually sting? So it's just the female bees that possess a sting because it's a modified ovipositor or egg layer which evolved into a sting. And in fact, a lot of our bees, they're so tiny like the solitary bees that if they did happen to sting you, which is really rare, then you wouldn't really feel much at all. So I've got a question for you. Are you a budding wildlife photographer? Need a little extra exposure? Well, send us in your best photographs and we'll show them on Go Wilder. 
as simple as. Email pics at imagetrail.com. So in this Pandora's box of entertainment and information, YouTube is full of good and bad stuff. But I thought I'd just give you a few recommendations of my own. The first is a fairly obvious one. Go and support and subscribe to your local Wildlife Trust channel. There's a great deal of content up here, and this is only my local office. From birds to bees to, well, everything nature, anything you wanted to know about what's going on around in the natural world. My second is an inspiring international wildlife photographer from Montreal. Now I love watching Stefano's videos. He's a font of knowledge when it comes to bird life and his camera work is second to none. And some of the places he goes, wow, amazing. Definitely worth a subscribe. And lastly, my third recommendation is Tom Mason. Now I follow Tom since he was a young lad. He's an inspirational photographer and he goes to some wonderful places from the UK to Africa and some great tutorials as well. Go check him out. And just as a bonus link, if you're ever in the market to buy a new or used lens, head over to Christopher Frost Photography. Another guy who knows his subject very well. Chris's in-depth reviews on all these lenses are really helpful if you're in the market for a new one. So earlier, our young bird fanatic from Braintree learned the difference between a sedge warbler and a reed warbler. Well, he's back again with another question. What other birds can be found in reed bed habitats? Right, over to you, Bob. Reed beds are actually a surprisingly diverse habitat, particularly for birds, although you're more likely to hear them than see them. Booming bittern, the jangling call of reed bunting, the explosive song of the Chetty's warbler, or the pinging of bearded tits as they fly across the top of the reed bed, or my favourite, the little piglet squeal of water ale. Here at Hicklin, you may be lucky to find some particular rare birds. We have crane, savage warbler, and even spotted crake. That's amazing, Bob, and a big thank you to Harry for submitting your questions. Many people think that bats are like mice in that they breed really fast and they have very large litters and that they're very short-lived and that they can cause infestations. In fact, the opposite is true. Um, bats actually have very low numbers of young, um, typically one, uh, and we call that a pup. And they are also potentially very long-lived and, and um, our tiny bats, even though they're so small, in captivity can live for up to about 30 years. Right, back to business and back to Isaac with another question for Rosie about bees. How long do bees live? Q Rosie. This question comes up a lot actually, so I'm really glad you asked. Um, so if we take bumblebee, so the queen bumblebee, she lives for almost a year um, because she spends the winter um, underground or tucked away somewhere waiting to emerge when it's warm enough in the spring to start up her colony. And the workers and males that she produces live for about four to six weeks, something like that. So a lot less than the queen. And if we look at solitary bees, so the males and females of the solitary bees have a similar lifespan to those of the worker and male bumblebees. So four, weeks, maybe six weeks if they're lucky. Thanks for all your questions, Isaac. Great, great job. And thank you, Rosie, as well. If you've got a question for our experts, email me at simonmccabe at me.com. Right, here's a thought. If you close your eyes and run in any directions, please do not do this, by the way. Roughly how long will it take you to crash into something? About three seconds. Isn't that the question from Aiden? How do bats find their way around in the dark? Over to you, Andrew. Bats can actually see. It's a bit of a myth that bats have poor eyesight, but they can see. But of course, in the dark, they need another strategy in order to, to forage. And their strategy, for, for, for the most part, and certainly this is true of all our British bat species, is to use what we call echolocation, similar to sonar that you, uh, you find in a, a submarine. And essentially that involves pinging out uh, a pulse of sound um, and listening, the bat will listen to the returning echoes. And, and in doing that, it builds up this 
a picture, a three-dimensional picture of the environment in which it's foraging, which is amazing when you think about it. It's, um, it, it, it's essentially seeing through sound. And not only can it see the environment in which it's foraging, but it can also see its insect prey. Uh, through through this echolocation system, I use the word see. Uh, it doesn't really see see the prey. It it, it, it builds up a sound picture um, to the point where it can actually capture an in insect in flight in complete darkness. And you can hear when we're out doing survey work, we're listening to the the bats' the pulses, the echolocation pulses going out very rapidly, and we hear them as a series of clicks um, of, of varying types of sound on a bat detector, on an echolocation detector. And this is a device that we use to convert the ultrasonic calls. They can be very, very high frequency and well outside our range of hearing into a, a, a range that we can hear. And you can hear when the bat's approaching an insect because to get more and more information, it fires faster and faster post pulses. And we hear a click, 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 click. As the bat gets close to its prey, and we call that a feeding buzz. It sounds like a buzz. It, so close in the end. Thanks for your questions, Aiden, and great answers there from Andrew. A fact for you bearded tits aren't actually tits. They're the only European representative of an Asian group of birds called parrot beals, hence why some people call them reed leaves. And finally, our last question goes back to Peter, and this one's a common issue, which I'm sure a lot of photographers will identify with. A lot of my pictures are coming out grainy. What should I do? Over to you, Rich. Hi there, Peter. That's a great question, and, and one also often asked um, when shooting in low light. Um, key things are really to keep the ISO as low as possible. A lot of the modern day cameras now allow you to use quite a high ISO and get away with quite a good image um, to save you going into the old post-processing and start messing around with your image too much. So key thing there, keep your ISO low, keep your camera on the lowest shutter speed possible um, for your subject. Obviously the higher the shutter speed the ISO would then increase. Um, have your lens wide open, so if it's an f4 lens have it at f4 or f2.8, so keep it quite, um, quite wide open, the maximum amount of light to come in. Um, also, vibration reduction and image stabilization that um, some of the manufacturers have just to keep that lens shape down and keep that image nice and sharp and then you won't have to bump the ISO up too much with the shutter speed. Um, and also, another key thing is well, shoot in RAW. If you do shoot in RAW and then you go back to your computer and the image is quite grainy, you can actually recover a lot of that grainy, noisy stuff um, and make that image just a little bit more clearer and sharper. Thanks to Pete and thanks to Richard for great Q&A. So on this week's quick fire round, we've got the awesome, talented Richard Burchett. Richard is an award-winning wildlife photographer from Cornwall. And with his military background, he's got all the right moves to get close to mother nature. So you've got 10 multiple choice questions, only one answer. What are we waiting for? On your marks, get set. Canon or Nikon? Canon. Morning or evening? Evening. Snickers or Mars? Snickers. Back button focus or shutter focus? Back button. Trees or fields? Trees. Waxwing or hoopoe? Waxwing. Poolside or beach? Beach. 72 200 f4 or 24 to 105 2.8? 70 to 200. Lager or GNT? Lager. Tripod or handheld? Handheld. Mmm, Snickers. Yummy. Go follow Richard's adventures on Instagram and YouTube. And there you have it. A lovely bunch of people and some great questions and some fabulous answers. A big thank you goes out to my questionnaire type people thingies. That's Isaac, Harry, Peter and Aidan. And not forgetting our panel of experts. That's Rosie, Bob, Andrew and Richard. Episode three and four are already in motion, so if you want to ask a question to any of our lovely panel of experts, I'll put my details in the description box below. Stay safe and go wilder. If you like this video, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel.